Okay, let's start. Uh, today's lecture is on logistic regression and survival analysis. Is this posted online? I just posted it now. Uh, okay. I have not able to open these files for this data. Okay. So this logistic, logistic regression belongs to a family of uh, generalized linear models. The linear model that we have seen up until now, like the last class, like linear regression, etc., they all are linear models. Hence, if you remember, we use the command LM, right? So LM is for linear models. The generalized form uses the function GLM, like generalized linear model. And these types of models can, uh, uh, like model data that is not appropriate for linear regression. The type of data is, for instance, if your dependent variable is either binomial like true false, the dependent one, not the independent one. If your dependent one is of like true false form, uh, or if it's count data or some other form of data then you cannot apply linear regression to it directly. For these types of models, we use these generalized linear models in which you use like something called a linear predictor, which are our independent variables. Remember our predictors. And then your response is transformed using some function, some link function. We call them link functions. And you will see what that means uh, shortly. But logistic regression, so we are in this class, we are just going to talk about this first type, the binomial uh, type of variables, dependent variables that is. Binomial variables of the type in which uh, the answer is whether something occurs or it does not occur. Okay, whether is something is true or so, something is, is not uh, true. Something exists, something does not exist. These types of yes or no type of questions. Okay. Uh, so if you remember we had like an uh, equation for a linear model which was that beta naught plus beta 1 times x plus the error term here this is how our general equation looks like what this essentially means is that your dependent variable the probability of that dependent variable to be 1 is this function okay which is a logistic regression function Okay, so this is a logistic regression function. How this works is that it works with logs, like log, log, logarithms or logarithms, whatever, right? Uh, logs are, uh, or they were introduced when we were like, our computing power was low, but the astronomers needed like extensive calculations. Logs basically reduce the calculation in manageable form, uh, like log 10 or log base 10 to something means that when it's raised to the power, you can get that many uh, calculations done. But anyway, uh, without going in the details of logs, etc. So this is the general formula. Are we ever going to use this one? No. But this is just there that to tell you that what we get in the end is or what we are trying to get is this thing that probability of the dependent variable being one. How do you get that? You get that through this function, which essentially translates to this function. Okay. So there are books, uh, there are in fact R books in which the whole derivation is given. But for us, I mean, uh, you just need to know that to find this thing, all we are looking for is this term. Okay. One over 1 plus e to the power of that variable okay the so in 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 this one it's labeled as y but down here it's x so essentially it should be if you're saying p y equals 1 it will be 1 over 1 plus e to the power of minus y okay uh, so this is just like uh, and when we use this then you will see like how we are using it. But what this 
inverse uh, logistic function or inverse uh, lo logic functions does is that it converts the continuous output from the predictor to fall between 0 and 1. Why? Because we need the answer in terms of probability. Okay. So probability if you remember is between 0 and 1. So this inverse function is it will use your predictors in linear form and convert them into a probabilistic form. Uh, here's continuous output means probability of uh, independent variables being one dependent variable. No, so continuous output from the predictor. So predictor is uh, can be anything. It can be, and we will see examples of both uh, uh, predictors can be uh, continuous. They can be categorical anything. Uh, but if you remember from linear regression last class is that when you have your predictors whether uh, continuous uh, categorical or etc you answer you get is in linear form okay here you get the answer again in linear form but we want the answer in probabilistic form that's why we take that linear form use this function and change it to probabilistic form okay so that's the only difference that in linear it's between linear linear to linear you're fine here you get linear you need to change it to probabilistic okay that's all uh, so this is from the book so first example we'll do from the book and the other one uh, we'll use like our own function so the book basically gives us data for this uh, like American community server for uh, the New York State which has so data if you open the data file it has all these columns in which uh, you have the size of a house so that was a survey basically conducted on a uh, like the state of New York in which it says if your house has these many rooms uh, these many people live there uh, what type of house it is and so on what's the uh, family income of the household and so on so there are different uh, columns or attributes coming from the US census okay so what we do first and what we are trying to do is that we are trying to find uh, like whether income like at a given income uh, or you can say uh, let me see so what are we saying is yeah we, we are calculating the income given these parameters so what is the probability of the income being greater than 150k okay what is the probability if a person lives in a four bedroom house uh, the type of house is single detached this that like all these properties what's the probability that the house uh, or the family income is greater than 150k okay to answer this type of question we first convert that uh, data into probabilistic form okay with the in the uh, sorry a binomial form a yes or no form okay so that's the first step so what we do is that we will create a new column called income which is true if income is above 150k otherwise it's false okay so in this spreadsheet so when you read it with the read table command ACS is what ACS is a data frame right so when you use the read table command uh, all this data comes as a data frame here so what are we do doing down here is that we created in the same data frame another column called income and what is that with function says uh, in this file if, if family income is greater than 150k it will write 1 in this column otherwise it will write 0 in this income okay the next step is we're going to find whether income is uh, yes or no given these variables okay so given e all these variables find a model first 
and then we can use that model to answer a question given all these variables okay so how you use this gen general or logistic regression is with this command glm for generalized linear model the same uh, logic applies as we were doing for last time so on the left hand side is your uh, dependent or your result or response on the right hand side are those independent variables or predictors okay so in this case we are using one two three four five predictors okay on the right hand side then the additional command in a logistic regression is this family command in which since we want the answer as yes or no we say it is binomial for other types of data like count and this and that you can use other commands here which we are not doing in this class and they are also not defined in the book but there are other books in which you can change the family to something else here okay and then our link function is logit so if you remember uh, here so we use a linear predictor but they are transformed using some link function okay so our link function is logit okay so logit is defined in mathematics okay as a log based function that will take these linear predictors which can be continuous or uh, uh, like quality data and spit back or give you a linear output that we will then transform using that inverse logit function okay that e1 that we saw so similar to uh, linear regression it gives us like it will come down in this variable and when you see the summary it will give you something like this okay So up here, the, our question is that given these different um, predictors, house cost, number of workers own rent, whether ho house is owned or rented and so on, right? F based on these, can you say that the income is greater than 150? Yes or no, right? So if that yes or no or true or false, so income, if it's above 150K, it's true otherwise it's false so this is a bi binary type of function right either it's above 150 or it's not yes or no when it's when your question or your left hand side this one is of this yes or no form you use a binomial function or family is binomial if you see the first slide where we say data is of different types binomial which is of true false if your question is of this type if your question is count data there are other forms if there are other forms of data there are other families okay but for this class we are only focusing on binomial questions uh, one more question mm -hmm. how do we decide what are dependent variables and independent variables how do you decide which are dependent which are independent here the dependent one was given in the question okay it is usually for the sake of us for the sake of learning it will be given for instance in your uh, lab that's due today it's also given okay and the type of variables for the lab or the exam sake they will be given but here they are just uh, chosen arbitrarily out of this big file that based on somebody's house cost or number of bedrooms and blah 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 tell me if you could have chosen only one or two or three okay and that is another point that we will see later that has to do with this AIC value down here okay so in linear regression you were given the intercept and this and that and you're done right the p-value and we just check that the same logic applies here you see the p-values but how you read these values is a little different and we will learn how to read this uh, in a moment but before that down here this AIC value 
AIC is similar to your adjusted R square or R square values that we get in linear regression. Okay. So in linear R square gives us what? Accuracy. Accuracy of the model, right? Here it does the same thing, but it does the AIC. But AIC is, um, so one rule of AIC is that the smaller the AIC, the better. So the value alone usually does not give us anything. Because is 18,000 a small value? No, it's not, right? But what AIC is used for is you start with, let's say, only one variable, you get one AIC value. Then you add another variable, you will get another AIC value. You compare the two AIC values. See which one is better. So better is the lower one. If having, let's say, three variables give you a lower AIC value, that means all three are useful. If only one variable gives you the better value, then that means adding those two additional ones gave you no advantage. So that's where that AIC value comes in. Okay, and we will see in the next example, uh, like a running example of this. And then there are other variables like null deviance uh, and residual deviance as well. Uh, but usually if AIC is given, then these essentially do the same thing. They tell you which type of or which fit or which model is better. But using AIC is better similar to adjusted R square versus R square. We say adjusted is a little bit better. So in the same way we say AIC is a little bit better if you need to compare two logistic models. Okay. So then we get these values down here. R coefficients just like we did in the linear regression. Those values alone by themselves are not useful because remember these are in linear form. We need to convert these to probabilistic form, which we use or which we do using this inverse logit function, which is 1 over 1 plus e to the power of that variables minus, right? So when we pass all these coefficients, all their values are basically this function is changing them to these values okay and i will come back to this after the next example like how we are going to use this or how we can use these but let's look at a simpler example first again using uh, dr bohan's uh, fitness app right so it's in it's everywhere it's ubiquitous <laughs> because it's uh, it's an easy app to understand or example to understand so again, Joe wants to sell some virtual goods in his fitness app. You know, those like our fitness apps have, uh, like video games have different avatars and this and that. Uh, so when people get hooked on to them, they would even pay for those things within a game. Uh, one of my uh, relatives, he got hooked on to some like you know these uh, city building games in which you build cities and armies and this and that. So he was playing that and he spent thirty thousand dollars on that game. So people are crazy and and he's my close relative. And I was like, are you and he's not rich. <laughs> no, he's not even rich. That's the problem. It's like 30, you know <laughs> thirty thousand over over three three years time. Oh, okay. But he was so hooked that uh, people actually spend that kind of money. I mean, for us, we think, oh, this is a... People actually spend, and I've seen that guy. I shouldn't say guy because he's, he's my, like, uncle. But he's, but he's crazy. <laughs> right? But anyway. Uh, anyway. So, but this guy, Joe, is not sure if people will pay for those virtual goods or not. Right? So he's interested in that based on somebody's usage hours on the app, can you predict whether they will buy the virtual good in the app or not? So note the question that whether they buy the good or not. So there are only two options in the question, yes or no, right? 
whether they will buy the goods or they will not. Based on what? Usage hours. So our independent variables is whether they will buy or not. Uh, sorry, the dependent is whether they will buy or not and independent is usage hours, right? And then there's another one which we will come and see. So the first case is first we read the file and the file looks something like this. So in the data, uh, in the survey, they ask these people who are doing living in these states, working these many hours in the gym with this much income. And the person said, yes, I will buy if there is something virtual. The other says, no, I will not. Yes, I will. No, I will not. And so on. Okay. So this is our sample data. So I wrote all these, uh, like they are written here. So you can just copy paste into R, like if you want to run them. So what are we analyzing? We are analyzing this variable, which is whether they will pay or not. Okay. Based on usage hours right so right hand side is usage hours and then you say my file name is this it should be fitness app app log not fitness log it should be this uh, no it's it's this variable sorry yeah so it's in this data frame and then the same thing family is binomial why yes, why yes, because the question is whether the person will buy or not Right, so it's a yes or no question, and link is that logit function that we are going to use. So you run it, you see the summary, we get something like this given to us. Okay, so remember up here we got all these values intercept and all these variables. Right, similarly, in this case, we have only one variable and the intercept. Right, so our intercept and that one variable hours right so our equation is this thing our linear equation that is so intercept plus this value times the uh, variable right just like linear regression yes okay up until now we have done nothing different just the same linear regression now we are saying that to get the probability of a yes, we have to use this function. Okay. So if this is our linear regression uh, equation, then can a user who uses the app for 10 hours, what's the probability whether he will buy it or not? Right. So that's, that's the type of question that you will get that fit the model first and tell me whether a person who uses the app for 10 hours will buy it or not right so you, you will just put this 10 here in this equation that you get for linear regression you get a linear answer so now you remember in the beginning we said we're going to choose the inverse logit function which is this to convert it into a probability so that's what we are doing here that what's the probability that the person will buy the app use that inverse logit function which is this one so whatever the value of y was you just put it in the equation and you get what probability 0.94 which is 94 percent it's likely right which is very high probability so yes anybody who uses app for 10 hours or more is likely to buy these virtual goods okay so here also note this thing 76.54 okay now the other question says if a user's yearly income and gym visit frequency so now you're using another variable right so now you have the person's incomes and gym visit so you're using these two to predict so let's see how that works uh, Oops, I pasted the wrong screenshot. Oops. Uh. <laughs> huh? No, no, on this slide, it's the same screenshot. It's this screenshot. 
which I will fix in the slides. Uh, can I get it? I'll have to run everything again. Uh, but I can continue. Yes, I think I can. So forget forget these because uh, so these are wrong. So what you get here is here will be minus eleven point four five for the intercept, and for incomes it will be this point zero nine and gym visits also point zero nine. Uh, point nine nine sorry okay those are the results <laughs> given here for these two variables so our equation becomes this thing and now your question will have these two variables given to you like if the person has this much income and goes to gym five times a week what's the probability he will buy it or not okay so then again you just plug it in you get a y value you use it in the uh, inverse logic function and you get a 83 percent probability okay but before you go into this first thing again you have to you still have to check the p-values you still have to check these p-values where, where they lie on this uh, scale three stars is right between 0 and 0 0.001 which is much less than our threshold of 0 0.05 so yes it works and secondly, you have to see this AIC value, okay? As you will see, I think as far as I remember, in this model, the AIC value is 83 something. If you run it, and when I like fix the slide, it's 80 something. It's, it's more than this variable. Hmm? So there are two cases. One is, if you compare these models, can you compare them? It's not a direct apples to apples comparison. Why? Because in here we are using an hours variable. In the other one, you're using uh, incomes and gym visits. So it's not the same types of variables. So only based on the AIC values, we cannot compare these two types of models. We only compare AIC value if you have hours here, and then you add something in addition to hours. Let's say you add hours and gym visits, right? Then you compare the AIC values of those two models. Like we should have two predictors, at least the same, same uh, number of predictors. Like hours and the other At least one pred uh, variable to be same in both models, yes, yes. To compare these AIC values. Uh, it's 76 here. What if there are three variables? If there are three variables, you will also get one AIC value. Then you have to compare those three variables, AIC value and this variable, AIC value. Whichever is lower, you accept that. Or you, you say this model is better. Okay? That with these many variables. In the lab, I tell you use all these variables. So you don't have to compare any AIC values. Okay? But saying for the sake of the exam, make a note here now so people who are present can be advantaged, right? So if on the exam, I ask you compare these models with AIC, now you know. So you people who are present should be advantaged. Make that note. If you don't make, no, I won't. <laughs> Why, okay, why, why do we compare AIC values? To decide, to decide which model is better. Which model is better? No, which model is better based on the AIC value? With the lower AIC values, which types of models can you compare? Where at least one, one predictor is the same. Okay, that's all. So you have to remember this for the exam. And I won't release recording of this class. Because yes. I'm mean. <laughs> okay. So that's how you use this inverse logic function. Okay. In this example, we will have a linear function based on all these values similar to that. And then if you're given a question, you can answer that. If you just want to look at the values how much they contribute to the model you can just 
get their uh, inverse logic and what you are given here is that owning and re renting outright this gives you about 85 percent uh, like this you can say it's, it, this is 85 percent um, part of your answer like it will give you 85 percent not the whole answer is 85 percent but uh, you can count on this variable 85% on this variable you cannot count much because it's 29% and so on okay but we don't use this directly we always use in a linear equa equation and then translate or transform that linear to inverse logistics okay so that is all about linear reg uh, sorry logistic regression any questions that is logistic regression we are done okay so let's take resume so so the question is not the slope so in, in intercept uh, is in this case 10.41 all the intercept tells you is if this variable is zero what's the value of this variable no no 10.41 meaning what if a person does not spend any time in the gym what was our why why was uh, pay or not right I mean, in, in this case, it doesn't make sense because pay or not is a, so you will have to translate that into a probability. Uh, but for a linear model, linear model from last time, so intercept gives you, if this variable is zero, what's the value of this variable? That's all. So if you remember from last time, we had what, uh, uh, hand span and person's height. So, so in this case, if we say person's hand span is zero, we still had some height of that person, right? Meaning that even if person has no hands, he still has some height, right? Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so survival analysis. Uh, survival analysis allows us to model the time until an event happens okay for instance so survival analysis we use terms as uh, like in medicine we say how long a person is alive based on this 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 disease predictors when will he die at which time or until which time he is alive if your hard disk is uh, or if your machine is running at this much temperature in this 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 at which time the hard disk will fail right at which time the network can go down so in these types of like predictor type of analysis or with when you're analyzing the survival of something on a given timeline based on all the historical data so you can answer those types of questions using survival analysis for us we are only going to answer those types of questions the models that are given in book and others like there are others uh, as well which i will show you but we are not going to go into them is then then what do you take that model and can you predict something as well in the future okay so that's the next step but for now so we are interested in how a set of variables or set of covariates like variables that are related to each other may influence the time to a given event when something happens such as a failure of an organ following a transplant or time of death of someone or server goes down and so on okay so how a set of variables may influence the time to an event the examples that are given here are from this package called survivor Survival has many different data sets. 
one is for the ovarian cancer data set okay so in this data set if you see these are the variables which define or which are defined as this function of time is the survival time of the person function statistics are something called a sensor status and I, I will explain it in the next slide what that means age is the age of person in years uh, any residual disease the person has yes or no uh, the treatment group uh, whether they are in the first treatment group like what are the remember those cancers have stages stage one stage two so these can be those it can be anything else that person is let's say uh, african-american or person is of Spanish descent because everybody has different genetic outcomes right uh, different genetic variables for instance and so on ECOG is uh, the ECOG performance status and so on so first thing censoring status what does that mean so sensor is that the event has not yet occurred okay so when we are analyzing the time until an event occurs the data is said to be censored so that type of data is missing you say it's missing it's not actually missing but you say that we don't know what's happening for instance for an organ to survive after a transplant right there can be three cases one is that the organ is still functioning right so the failure has not yet occurred so our event is failure or that organ failing so that's our event whenever that organ fails you say it's a one if it's not failed yet you will have a zero in there in here f u stat one means at this time that organ failed at this time the organ is still not failed we don't know what's happening to it it has not failed yet at this time it has not failed oh sorry it has failed okay so when an event happens you have a one otherwise it is called to be censored or in other words when it's zero you say it's censored because we don't know because it's still functioning or the patient died of something else you changed his liver but he died of a heart attack so is the liver to blame no right so we don't know the success of the transplant when the organ fails itself when after the transplant the liver fails you say event has occurred so you put a one in the column okay or the data has one in that kind of column for the top two cases it's missing so when it's missing you say it is censored because we don't know the time because we the event has not occurred yet okay so this in this case is recorded in the fu stat we said earlier so it's recorded here when the organs fail and you can uh, like run your aggregates and see these things so when you run the aggregate uh, sensor times are with state 0 uh, with state 1 your means uh, or your median is 359 uh, seconds and so on okay but anyway how do you use survival analysis so the first thing is we have to create an object that can combine those variables of interest into a survival function so survival function is essentially a plot okay so there is a property of a survival function that anything uh, so this is time 0 let's say time 10 time 100 okay right now when you replace the transplant the this is let's say time or the probability of survival is what it's very high right because you just replaced it as time goes on or your age goes on your parts are 
not exponentially. Uh, gradual. Gradual is the right word, right? Not exponential. It's it's gradual. Uh, it's not linear. No, because it's not that five year, ten year. It's not linear. It is somewhat gradual. Okay, because in the clo closer to um, when you replaced it, the probability of survival is quite high. Then it can gradually decrease. Okay. So in any survival function, this is how our graph looks like. Okay, in any survival function, this is how graph will look like. And we are trying to model this equation. Why out of the data? Because we want to say at time 75, what is the probability that the person can die? So when we plot this thing, we can come to the graph, see this point and get our probability for that time. Okay, so this is essentially looking at our past or historical data and finding that what's the probability at a given time person can die or the liver can uh, malfunction and so on. <clears throat> so when you give this serve command or survival command, you have to give uh, the two variables as this, our event variable and our sensor variable. So sensor is written in, in this event. Event is whenever that sensor happens or when the event actually happens. And the other one is that you're calculating or plotting against. You're plotting against time here. Okay. So you get this type of result. If you see the variable, you will see these things. Wherever you have a plus, that means that that was a censored value. We don't have results for that. Or that event has not yet occurred okay so you use this variable then in another command to find this that i just showed you like this probability and you use it right here so that variable using the survival fit when you say survival fit it will give you this time chart and this one essentially means uh, uh, that we are plotting one variable, okay? Or we are fun uh, interested in uh, one variable to be plotted, okay? And this is that I just explained. So this survival column is essentially that is plotted like this. And to plot it, you get this KMOV variable. So you use that variable in the plot and you will see something like this. Okay. So when you say Kepler Meyer uh, plot, like if you give that variable, so R knows how to plot it, it will plot it and give you a range of values as well. Now looking at the plot, and these values, let's say at 49, uh, or let's say question is at time 800, what's the probability of survival? 0.49. Yeah, it's 0 0.49. You can see that from here, right? So you can look at the graph to pinpoint like this and to get the exact value, you can go in the ballpark and see the exact value. Okay. The result that's given to you. So that is, so there are two bases or two ways to estimate. One is uh, this non-parametric in, in which you use this surfit function and then just plot it. The other is called parametric in which you uh, use different distributions and get the coefficients and results and use them to predict something, which we are not doing in this class. So that is all for this lecture. But there are two additional slides in which I tell you how to use them if it's parametric, uh, but we're not going there. That's why I put a blank slide, so don't go past this. If you want to, I don't care. Okay.
that is all